So if you're going to be doing A-level physics, it's really worth looking at some of the math skills that you need as you go into the course. And to be honest, a lot of the maths that you need for A-level physics, you will have covered at some point when you've been doing GCSE physics and also GCSE maths. However, it does really rely on it. Now I'd say that probably most students tend to be doing A-level maths as well. And actually that's brilliant because a lot of the topics you do in A-level maths, for example, equations of motion, CVAT equations, you do the same topics in A-level physics as well. However, even if you're not doing A-level maths, you can still get really high grades. I've had students before who got A-stars in physics, even though they didn't do A-level maths. But in this video, I want to show you some of the basics. I want to remind you about stuff you might have seen before and actually show you how this is relevant as we go into this A-level physics course. So the first thing is that maths is going to be absolutely everywhere. There's going to be a lot more equations used and you're going to have a huge amount of practice over the coming years. Now, I suppose one thing which is, I suppose, let's just go with probably one of the biggest differences and that's the way that we show units. Now at GCSE in terms of units we might have showed maybe something uh, with a speed or a velocity has the units of meters slash seconds. That means the amount of meters covered per second and we can also think about this as meters over seconds and the way that we represent this when it comes to A level is meter second to the minus one. Now ultimately the reason we do this is to make things as simple as possible. Later on we might have units of kilogram meter squared s to the minus two. We can see that um, if we were to start writing this on different lines it might get really confusing. Actually something like this is also called the Newton and that makes it um, I suppose a bit more simple because this is one of our derived units from these base units but we'll cover that as we go into the A level course. Now the other thing we need to think about is when it comes to any questions you might get asked, we need to think about an appropriate number of significant figures. Now this is something that will have been covered at GCSE, but it's really important to A-level. If, for example, you have a question where the raw data is given to two significant figures, then you can really justify giving your final answer also to two significant figures. If the raw data is given to three significant figures, then your final answer should be given to three significant figures. But if you have raw data with a mix of maybe two significant figures, uh, three significant figures, and also four significant figures, you can only justifiably give your final answer to the least amount of significant figures, which in this case would be 2SF. And that's really important, and it's just good habits to get into. But that is only when you show your final answer. Any intermediate answers you should store in your calculator or write down the full number so that you're not rounding down or rounding up too early. And when it also comes to giving your final answer, standard form is really important. And what we mean there is maybe something times 10 to the 6 or times 10 to the 2. And this is because, especially at A-level, we do lots and lots of stuff with really small numbers. Perhaps when we're looking at inside the atom, the atomic physics, or even really, really big numbers, maybe when we're looking at gravitational fields. So we're going to go from the really small to the really big. And you can't just write down something like 0 0.000002. That's just not good physics. It's a lot better to give it in standard form. And ultimately, that means you're not going to make as many mistakes with any data that you might have. So standard form is really important. Now, going back to GCSE, you might have done stuff, especially in maths, with triangles. Triangles come up all the time. And I would say that 99.9% .9 of the time, we're going to be looking at a simple right-angled triangle. Now, you don't need a huge amount of equipment for A-level physics, but definitely a ruler, definitely a clear 30 centimetre ruler is really important, as is a pencil. And basically, if you have a triangle, and you know the length of this side, A, and you know the length of that side, B, you can calculate the length of that side. And this is to do with Pythagoras, where basically what we can say is that C squared is equal to A squared plus B squared. Okay, very simple. You know that already. You'll have known it for many years, but that comes in really handy, especially when you're dealing with vectors and trying to work out um, maybe the, the distance or the displacement if you know um, this vector and that vector. So that comes up all the time. So Pythagoras is really important. But what we really rely on at A level is trigonometry. Again, this is to do with right angle triangles. Now here, we might know one of the angles, which I'm going to call theta. So that's just an unknown angle. And the longest side in this right angle triangle is the hypotenuse. 
the side which is next to this angle is the adjacent side and this one over here is the opposite side. Now again, this often um, is used when we're looking at vectors. Maybe we're resolving forces into its different or separate components, but you've got to remember this. And there's a relationship between this angle and the ratio of this side to this side, this side to this side, or this side to this side. I always remember it as Sokotoa. And what we can say is that sine theta is equal to the ratio of the opposite over the hypotenuse. We can do the same for cos and tan. So we've got Sokotoa. Okay, so that is really, really important. And if you're not sure, then it's always worth, maybe just in a different colour, um, annotating the triangle that you've drawn with the adjacent, opposite and the hypotenuse. And almost by a couple of months in, it will become second nature. You'll just know if we're looking at cos or sine, especially when it comes to maybe resolving a force into its separate components. And what I mean by that is perhaps if you had a force acting at an angle theta, then the component of force in this horizontal direction down here, well, we've got a closed angle, so that's going to be equal to F cos theta. That's really important because we might have a moment calculation where the forces aren't acting uh, perpendicular to the dis distance from that pivot that you know about. It might be works being done by a force at an angle to the displacement of that object moving, and so on. So yeah, this thing over here comes up all the time, and you're going to get better at it just by practicing as many questions as possible. So we've got uh, the units, we've got how to display answers, and we've got some of this revision about the triangular or trigonometry, the triangular maths from GCSE. Something else that happens all the time is you need to be used to rearranging equations and making something else the subject of that equation. Now the advantage of A-level is that you do get a data sheet which pretty much has all of the equations given to you, so you don't need to remember them all. But uh, let's think about maybe a very simple example. Uh, let's say A is equal to B times C. You need to be able to show that B is equal to, in this case, A over C. Okay, stuff like that happens all the time. Uh, if you've got A is equal to B times C squared, and we want to make C the subject, well, what we do is the both, same thing to both sides. So we're going to divide both sides by B. So that's A over B. And we want to have C on its own. And here we've got C squared. To get C on its own, we're going to square root that other side. Okay, fairly straightforward. But again, you're going to get lots of practice at that. The other thing that you might be doing is if you had, say, for example, A is equal to B times C, and also C is equal to D times E, we might have two separate equations, and we can maybe substitute one into the other. So we can replace the C term over here to say that A is equal to B times D E. Okay, so this happens all the time, and what we're looking at is um, a lot of algebra, and actually doing some manipulation, and if you rearrange everything before you start the um, calculation, it means you can put all your numbers in once, rather than having lots of substitution numbers everywhere. So yeah, hopefully that makes sense. This is something that you will develop. Now, pretty much, that is all of the, the kind of maths that you need for A-level physics, until you get to year 13. And this is really where students who are doing maths A-level do have a bit of an advantage, because what we look at are um, logarithmic functions and exponential functions. Now what we mean there is we could say that y is equal to e to the x. So this is an exponential function. And what we can do is take lo uh, the natural log of both sides to say that the natural log of y is equal to x. Okay, that might be very new if you've just come from GCSE. The other thing we might have is we might have log to the base 10. So we could say that y is equal 10 to 10 to the x. And what we could then say is that log y is equal to x. So this is log, in this case, to the base 10, which is what we tend to use in physics, or we have the natural log. Why is that important? Well, what we really look at in A-level is y equal to y is equal to e to the minus x, and this is an exponential decay. This is what you will have covered at GCSE when you've looked at half-life, but now we actually use some equations for that. If we were to maybe look at the activity of a radioactive sample, the activity depends on the initial activity times e to the minus lambda t, and this is just a decay constant of how quickly that thing decays, and that's the time taken. And the reason we need to know about these natural logs is we could take natural logs of both sides. So say the natural log of A is equal to the natural log of A naught minus lambda t. 
that's important. Um, and this will become a lot more apparent as you go through your A-level physics. And finally, the last bit I'd like to talk about, uh, let's do it over here, is looking at graphs, okay? And most of the time, we tend to get graphs that have a line of best fit that maybe goes through some data. So perhaps we've done an experiment or you've been given some data and you might get a graph that looks like this, okay? So here we have uh, the y-axis up here, the x-axis, and the gradient of this line is equal to y is equal to mx plus c. So c is the y-intercept when x is equal to zero, and m is a gradient, and you have to be able to plot some data, you have to be able to calculate accurate gradients, and this just often involves drawing a large triangle onto the line of best fit that you've put in. And it's also worth noting that a lot of the time the graphs that we have, they don't always start from zero on the x-axis. So it might be that if you know a, uh, maybe a, a plot on the line, you've got an x and a y value, if you've calculated the gradient m, this then allows you to find the y-intercept, even if you can't read it off the graph directly. So that is pretty much the maths that you need, that you will become familiar with as you go into A-level physics. So a lot of this, you know, you might have seen this stuff definitely at GCSE. You'll have seen all of this stuff at GCSE, so there's no new information there, but it's just you're going to be using it all the time. Trigonometry and Pythagoras, that's something you're going to develop your skills with and actually just use it again all the time in any questions you do. We've got rearranging equations, you'll have seen that before. And really for A-level physics, the only new bit of math that you might not have covered is looking at log uh, logarithmic functions. But to be honest, you'll develop that as you're looking at half-life, looking at capacitors, maybe looking at the attenuation of x-rays. So that is the maths that you need to understand for A-level physics.